Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Tom and Diana. I, I thought this was an absolutely brilliant book. I, uh, through the magic of Kindle, I had the opportunity to read it, and um, somehow it manages to be scholarly without being pretentious. Uh, you have a sense that every sentence, every word, is being carefully weighed and carefully judged, and it's it's really it's really a good read. Um, and that's not often true in this field. Sometimes, for me as an economist, I, I read some of this stuff as gobbledygook, but this book I, I thought was just really brilliantly written. So uh, again, I have no shares in the book. Do go out and buy it and read it, because it's, uh, it's really good. Um, and one thing that's admir admirable about it is the way in which it, um, ex it, it really brings together, as, as uh, Tom said at the beginning, all the arguments, it tries to get its arms around all the different viewpoints, and it puts them in a very fair way. I mean, you do get, you do get the uh, clear impression at the end that we know what you think, which is good, but you also get the impression that you've heard all the other arguments expressed as cogently as they can be expressed throughout the book. And I think that's, I think that's a really unusual combination of, of com having a position, but also uh, fairly expressing everyone else's opinion. And lastly about the book, and then I'll come to some substantive issues. Um, uh, uh, I've, uh, I've had a kind of uh, ringside seat in lots of political, interesting political issues, and I read books and articles about things that are supposed to have happened, and they're very rarely how I remember what happened. <laughs> that may just be a difference of perspective or difference of, of information. Um, this, for the parts of this book that I had a ringside seat for, this is how I remembered it. Uh, and that, for me, that's a good sign. Um, or perhaps that just means that you see the world through the same eyes as I do. I don't know. But so it, it, I, I had the sense that it was very well researched, very thorough, uh, and for me, very accurate. So that's that's the good news. Um, uh, I guess the point of being a respondent is is to think of things to disagree with. Um, I, I I feel a bit uncomfortable doing that because I agree with nearly all of the book. But let I, I have three. Not, not disagreements, but things I think it would be good to discuss, uh, not just amongst us, but as a group. Um, uh, so I, I, in doing that, I don't want to, to detract from the, the overall thought that this is really a tour de force. Um, so you challenge us to think about why this is an, an almost revolution, um, uh, and it isn't a, uh, an adjective. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so there's one set of reasons which you've just talked about, the idea that um, aid agencies uh, and, and the staff of aid agencies have been reluctant to get involved in politics, um, partly because some people take the view that it's just not right for one country to be involved in the politics of another country, um, uh, and partly because there are people who think that the purpose of development cooperation is not to change other people's political systems, but to bring about reductions in poverty or some, some other socio-economic benefit, but, but that you can do that without involving yourself in politics. And you, you've charted the, the evolution of the argument on this, and um, uh, you're, you're clearly right that in the past couple of decades, there's a much stronger consensus that politics matters, and indeed that it's hard to think about development without thinking about politics. I say evolution, it's still the case that there are people in the system who don't buy that, right? There's, an, by coincidence, a blog today by Duncan Green describe is, describing an experience yesterday at the World Bank where he was talking about his book From Poverty to Power and the, um, the head of poverty reduction at, uh, in the Africa part of the World Bank uh, basically says this is all a huge distraction, all this stuff about politics and, and so on. We know what works, we just need to go out and do it. And you know, you're getting involved in all this politics stuff, and you shouldn't be. That's a distraction from the main issue, which is going out and, and doing what works. So there, pl there clearly are pe still people out there who resist the idea that we should be thinking politically at all. I'm not one of those. Um, there may be people in the room. We should have that discussion. But I'm, I'm comfortable with where we've got to. Um, so. Why are donors reluctant to finish the revolution then, if, if, if enough of us are agreed uh, that it's about politics? So one possible answer is, well, they are investing. In it. The, the, the revolution is complete. Um, DFID, uh, I think it's still true, when I last checked, had more governance advisors than economists. 
Um, now that suggests, you know, that they're taking this agenda fairly seriously. Um, of course, what a governance advisor is um, can vary, and we can we can talk about whether that's really a political uh, function. But but nonetheless, you say that that about you know um, uh, five to ten percent, or ten to fifteen percent of aid now is being spent. That's quite a lot. I mean, this isn't a very money-intensive activity. Um, so maybe maybe you should declare victory and, and uh, decide that this is actually the, the revolution has been completed. But why why hasn't it gone further? You actually give. Let me. Uh, there are five reasons which I thought were quite compelling. Um, the first is that uh, um, political aid providers, because they have an, a liberal elite conception of politics. Um, are sometimes not willing to help poor people directly challenge powerful elites in their countries. That they just have an elite conception of politics, which means they don't want to. Their philosophy is not to be involved in the way they would need to be for a political uh, a political view of development. The second, which you mentioned just now, the aid community as a whole is still primarily rooted in a model of cooperation between government rather than challenge. Uh, the third is that. Um, the interest that donor governments have in the development of the countries to which they provide aid is simply not strong enough to induce them to engage in the difficult, risky, unpopular business of trying to bring about political change in other countries, even if they didn't have other fish to fry in those countries. I mean, even if they didn't have security or, or commercial reasons, that it's just an unpopular thing to do to get involved in, in other people's politics. Uh, fourthly, um, that there's a gap between um, the strength of our interest in development and the basic difficulty of overcoming the forces that prevent progress. That it's just that we don't have a strong enough interest in development to really need to invest in overcoming the forces that stop it. And then finally, and I, this is one to come back to, even if aid providers, I'm quoting, even if aid providers were determined somehow to change the core power structure in a society to get to the roots of its developmental shortcomings, they lack the kind of definite knowledge about how such foundational changes might occur. In other words, we don't know how to do it. So those are five possible reasons why donors aren't taking this seriously. Um, so that brings me to the first worry about this agreement. A lot of those are to do with donor politics. And I felt in your book that you were much stronger on thinking about politics in developing countries than about politics in donor countries. Um, uh, you're right to criticize the development community for assuming for many years that, um, politi that, that all the governments are willing, wanting to change things, and all they need is technical expertise. And when we provided the te technical expertise or the resources, they didn't change. And it turned out it was because uh, there were political reasons why they were doing what they were doing. That same analysis needs to apply to donors. And, and we need a, a richer analysis of what it would take to change donor attitudes to this. And we don't have that yet. I, you know, and say uh, that's clearly a big part of the answer for why the development industry isn't doing this. Uh, you know, the, the reasons in your book that I just read out are pretty compelling political reasons for not, tr not taking this agenda seriously. And I don't know how, uh, you know, we can all sit around saying it'd be nice if we did overcome it, but that, is, that isn't going to change it. Secondly, I think this last point, that we don't know how to solve this problem, is really quite important, <laughs> right? Even, I mean, imagine a hypothetical world in which we did know how to solve the problem. That we, uh, we could spend some amount of money, and that would bring about some kind of Western-style liberal democracy that was, you know, a mixed market economy. I think there are probably lots of people in this room, and I would be one of them, who would think that would be a good thing to do and we should do it. And the reason we don't do it is because we don't live in that hypothetical world where we know how to solve this problem. And the things we have done have been largely unsuccessful. And what I felt was a, a part of the book that I would have liked to hear more about is what you think we should do about that. Because when I, when I read the recommendations at the end of the book, and I get the same, David Booth is sitting over there, I get something of the same impression from David's writings. You get this feeling that, you know, we've tried something a bit technical, technical solution to this problem, and that hasn't worked. So what we need is more technicians. What we need is more analysis, more evidence, more data collection, people on the ground, political analysis, that we're going to solve this problem technically. My sense is that this is, 
we, that's probably the wrong way to think about this. That these are, you know, in, in the uh, one way to think about this is a, as complex adaptive systems. That these are systems that you can't solve technically. However hard you model them, however much information you gather, however much data you have, these are not the kind of problem that you can solve by um, calibrating your intervention right and then introducing it. And that what we should be looking for is uh, ways in which we can help those systems themselves heal themselves, become more adaptive. Fit the, 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 rather than trying to solve problems, we should be trying to help systems be better systems. Um, there's a, a, a guy at the Bank of England here called Andy Helbing, who's in, who's in charge of financial regulation, who published a paper recently about uh, the increasing complexity of financial markets and what should regulators do about it. And his answer was we should reach for simplicity. You can't, if you've got a complex problem, you don't solve it by trying to find com ever more complex interventions. You solve it by moving back to very simple interventions, simple rules of thumb that help shape the system. And I think that, that one reason why this revolution isn't finished is that, is that the story that what we need is, is more political scientists just doesn't seem like a credible answer to, to the fact that we don't know what kinds of interventions work here. And that takes me to the, to the third and probably most controversial disagreement. If we, if we don't know how to do this, if we don't have good evidence that the kinds of polit politically savvy interventions that we would like to see are going to work, how sure are we that this is a good purpose for the aid program? We often talk about aid as if it's either humanitarian aid or developmental aid. And humanitarian aid is about 8% of total aid, so 92% of aid is developmental. But actually, most aid isn't trying to bring about development. Most aid is trying to improve people's lives. It's trying to vaccinate children, stop them from dying. It's trying to bring people food or access to clean water, uh, stop them having to, to walk for hours to fetch water, uh, give people housing and shelter and perhaps jobs and employment <coughs> and incomes. And maybe it's enough to say that we don't know how to bring about development, but we do know how to bring about all these good things. Not humanitarian, not in a humanitarian situation, but just in countries that may or may not be in a process of development. Now, it would be nice to accelerate development, to bring about political change and social and economic change. But if we don't know how to do that, why would we want to take money from something we do know how to do, which helps people live better lives, and spend it on something that we're not sure is going to work? And furthermore, are there not other things that we could be doing that are more likely to affect the politics of development that don't involve using the aid budget? Should we, for example, be making uh, stronger plans to limit arms sales to um, undemocratic governments? Should Paul Collier has this idea of a, of a security uh, guarantee. That could change the politics. We could be reforming international institutions. There are all kinds of non-aid things that look like more plausible candidates for affecting the the evolution of politics in developing countries. And so it seems very odd to say that aid is a, is a good instrument for doing that. That isn't because political change isn't important. It absolutely is important. But the fact that something's important doesn't mean that we should necessarily spend aid on it. If it's important, we should spend aid on it if we have some, if we have some reason to believe that doing so is going to make a difference. And it's not obvious to me at this point that we know that it is. So three kind of differences of, of nuance in what, what basically I agree with your analysis, but so the, the, three, the three reservations. One is I don't think it does justice to the, the political difficulties in donor nations and how we overcome that. Uh, secondly, the fact that we don't know what to do um, and your prescription seems to be, well, then do more of it. Do it, har do it more, do it harder. Do and you're going to say that isn't your prescription, so. But that's how it, that's how it read to me. Um, d doesn't feel convincing. And thirdly, um, I, it seems to me you're making an assumption that you don't really discuss that, that the purpose of aid ought to be to bring about development. And maybe we should settle for a more modest but still extremely important goal of using aid to, to bring about improvements in people's lives, whether or not that contributes to development. So uh, quibbles in what I thought was an absolutely excellent book. But I hope that 
stimulates a bit of conversation and reaction either from you or from the group here. Thank you, Owen. Um, if you agree, Tom and Diane, shall we take a, some sure. image? Or do you want to? I'll find a way to slip in two responses to, to one of the questions, but I'd like to hear from other people. Yeah. Okay, let's hear from other people. Um,